We are now in public session. Apologies have been received from Fergus O'Dowd. At the request of the broadcast and recording server, members and visitors in the public gallery request to ensure that for the duration of the meeting their mobile phones are turned off completely or switched to airplane or safe or flight mode depending on their device. It is not sufficient just to turn phones off on silent mode as it will maintain a level of interfering with the broadcasting system. And before we go into item number one, uh, with the agreement of the committee, I have to step out for a few minutes and Senator Boyan has agreed to take the chair if the committee are willing to do that. Isn't it, yeah? Thank you all. Uh, um, in engagement with the Irish National Election Study, I would like to welcome to today's meeting representatives from the Irish National Election and Referendum Study, Dr Jane Souter, Professor David Fen Farrell sorry, and Dr Theresa Reddy. Do you know privilege? Before we begin, I wish to draw your attention to the fact by virtue of Section 17.2.1 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee, sorry there, you should nearly know this off by heart, to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to do so, you are only entitled thereafter to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter on these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, person or identity by name or in such way to make him or her or it identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment or criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such way to make as to make him or her identifiable. Now I would like to call on Dr. Reddy to make your opening statement. Uh, thank you very much uh, indeed for this opportunity to engage in this uh, public um, consultation. I'm speaking on behalf of my, my colleagues, Professor Farr and Dr. Souter, but also on behalf of a, a wider group of uh, political scientists that work on elections um, research and referendum research at, at uh, most of our, our universities. Um, I, Ireland has a, a long and proud democratic uh, tradition and citizens have quite high levels of trust in the electoral process and participation um, in elections and referendums is, is stable, although at a relatively modest level over the last number of, uh, of decades. And audits of Ireland's electoral process uh, conducted by the Electoral Integrity Project can confirm that there are high levels of integrity and trust among citizens in the process, but they do highlight a number of problematic areas uh, which are sometimes obscured by the, uh, the, overall, uh, the overall trust levels, and those include the electoral registration process, uh, party financing, and also access to the electoral process for women and mi minorities. Um, Irish democracy is, is resili resilient and it emerged more diverse from the economic uh, crisis, uh, but that has not been the experience everywhere. The uh, rise of radical right populist parties and violent protest um, social movements in a number of states uh, point to high levels of voter dissatisfaction and clear points of weakness in democratic politics. And democracy is, is not an inevitable political outcome, and we have seen considerable democratic backsliding um, around the world in the last number of, of decades. And all of this really highlights the need to, to nurture and to invest in the democratic process. Uh, for Ireland, elections and, and referendums are the cornerstone of our democracy. And in recognition of this, today we're here to argue for the creation of a permanent democratic audit process, which would be a study of each referendum and uh, election. In most democracies, funding is provided, usually to the political science community, to carry out elections and referendum research. This research generates evidence which is usually used to inform public debates, uh, shape policy making and enhance political campaigns. Uh, it's used not just by political um, scientists but by members of parliament, uh, policy making community, political parties, civil and voluntary organisations, so the evidence is used widely. Ireland is especially unusual in not having this type of ongoing review of its democratic policy, politics. 
A funded election study was in place between 2002 and 2007, operated through the Irish Research Council, but since then political scientists have not been able to secure consolidated funding for elections uh, or referendum research. In 2011 and again in 2016, political scientists scraped together funding to study these elections, but the resources were hardly sufficient to produce the type of study required for a proper democratic audit. Referendum voting has never been systematically studied. Uh, any research that has been carried out has been ad hoc, and the objectives are shaped by the funding uh, agencies, the commissioning agency. That might be newspapers, RTE, uh, and oftentimes government departments. Uh, but government departments are usually interested when a referendum fails, so we know a great deal about why people don't vote for things, but actually a lot less about why people do vote for, for things, which is an unusual uh, uh, situation to be in. So a national ele uh, election and uh, referendum study would provide in-depth understanding of the way representative democracy works in Ireland. It would deliver unique insights into Irish public opinion, political participation, attitudes towards politics and explanations of electoral outcomes. Uh, the data from 2002 to 2007 um, and the partial studies in 2011 and 2016 have been used by Oireachtas committees, broadcasters, political parties, civil and voluntary organisations. The evidence collected has informed debates and public policy in areas including uh, voter registration, political education, reform of political institutions and populist political communication. <coughs> Ireland is an old democracy celebrating its centenary this week um, and it has much to offer in terms of its democratisation and consolidation experience and it's actually frequently used and included in international studies although the election and referendum research conducted in Ireland has often been imperfect due to lack of funding. Um, the Irish uh, experience of democracy has been central in forming policy debates internationally on political institutions, electoral reform and electoral integrity. The form and scale of uh, election and referendum studies vary around the world, but the research is usually conducted in pre- and post-vote stages and involves questionnaires administered by professional polling companies. Most of the questions included in these surveys are tailored to the political environment in Ireland, but there are some cross-national um, uh, there are some questions included uh, from cross-national studies, and that facilitates international comparison and locating Ireland in a wider experience of, uh, of democracy. Uh, and it also enhances the quality and usefulness of the data that is uh, generated. Uh, the topics covered are diverse, but at recent elections, uh, research in Ireland, questions have been asked on attitudes about political institutions, the role and performance of public representatives, um, populist political views, uh, reasons for voting and non-voting. Uh, and that's a particularly important one because it's an area where there's a lot of interest. But those questions were only possible in 2002 to 2007 when there was this, this better funding um, situation. We've had questions on political reform and also on political values. Uh, in 2000, between 2002 and, and 2007, the funding for that election study came from uh, a combination of the Programme for Third Level Research in Ireland and the Irish Research Council. But owing to changes in the funding environment due to the economic crisis, it has not been possible to secure funding, uh, a regular funding source for uh, elections and referendum uh, re research. And only very limited uh, studies were possible at the elections in 2011 and 2016 using ad hoc arrangements. And as I say, no funding has ever been provided on a permanent um, footing for, for referendum research. Small amounts of funding have been secured from RTE, Google, um, sometimes the houses of the, the, the Oireachtas to put together these, these smaller studies. But these have been very imp imperfect. And, and particularly want to kind of highlight the marriage and abortion referendums uh, in which there have been huge international research, uh, huge international interest, but, but very limited research um, uh, actually has been conducted in Ireland on, on these. Since 2007, political scientists have engaged with the Irish Research Council, the Central Statistics Office, politicians, civil servants, um, all in an effort to secure a permanent stable funding for this type of, uh, of research. While there is wide support for the research owing to its extensive use and dissemination, funding efforts have been unsuccessful. Uh, and part of the reason for this is that elections and referendums often happen at short notice, as you all well know, um, and, and on an irregular schedule. 
uh, but the research is time sensitive, so it has to be carried out right before and after the actual electoral uh, event, so usually within a number of weeks. Uh, and this is, th these are kind of unusual features to the kind of research that's involved and provide probably the main stumbling blocks to <coughs> establishing a permanent funding stream. Uh, as is the case in other democracies, a dedicated and flexible budget line needs to be established. Uh, this could be managed from a government department, an electoral commission, um, or channeled through the Irish uh, Research, uh, Research Council. Uh, and today, really, we are asking the committee to make a recommendation uh, to support funding for the election and referendum research uh, in Ireland, uh, because we believe this uh, research is vital to inform public debates, public policy, and political campaigns. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Reddy. Do either of your colleagues wish to add to that or at this point? No, we're happy to take questions and okay. see what the interest is. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, we'll open to the floor now and to the members. Uh, Deborah O'Brien. Chair, thank you very much and, and thank you for the, the presentation. Um, I suppose really just a, a few practical questions maybe to, to give the committee more information. Uh, I think it would be useful if you put on the record a little bit more detail about maybe the last study that you did in terms of the mechanics of setting it up, of deciding what would be asked, who would be asked, um, uh, the costing of that particular study, uh, and maybe some of the key findings, just so I think me members who might not be uh, uh, familiar with the detail of it get a little bit more flavour. I think that could be useful. The other thing, obviously, is <coughs> there's one of these questions, which is how long is a piece of string? So you can do small pieces of research on an ongoing basis, larger pieces of research. Can you talk the committee through <coughs> the range of options that could be available if government was of a mind uh, to fund such research on an ongoing basis? And, you know, are there examples from your point of view as political scientists of best practice in other, for example, comparable EU member states? Or, you know, what's, what's the best kind of option uh, from a, a, an evidence-based point of view? Um, I mean, as a strong supporter of an independent electoral commission, it would seem to me that an electoral commission is the logical place to locate such a fund. Do you have views on that? Do you think... The, the, the research element that the research council would have might be more appropriate or are you neutral on it if you could give us your views on it um, and then I suppose two final points one is obviously a key thing in the research is is who decides what questions to ask how is the terms of reference framed uh, uh, and it's not that we're all suspicious and cynical people in here but clearly that's a big that's a big question in terms of the utility of such information to people like us so can you talk us through maybe in the round from 2002 to 2007 how that process worked uh, and really then just the last point is a comment um, I, I'm a big supporter of any evidence-based research that gives people more information about what goes on in our political process I think the more evidence we have the better this is a, a committee that spends a long amount of time trying to prize information out of government departments uh, and I think one of the values of, of publicly funded research like this is it gives everybody access to all of the data so smaller political parties who can't afford opinion polling local community-based groups and advocacy groups, committees like this get access to all of it. And I just think, as a committee, it's important that we understand this isn't just some technocratic exercise where a group of political scientists get to do what they like to do. This does produce a, a resource that, if it's done right, gives everybody in our democracy access to something that, today, only large newspapers, government departments, the European Commission, and larger political parties can really afford. And I think that, in itself, gives your proposition of us considering recommendations real merit, which of course we'll discuss in, in private session. Okay, so there's a number of questions there from uh, Deputy O'Brien. Do you want to, uh, Dr. Reddy, do you want to kick off there or whatever? Or David, do you want to start? Do you want to start? Or... Um, I, I might start, but there okay. are a lot of questions, so yeah. forgive me if I yeah. don't Take your time. Uh, we can... go through them all. But just to give you a flavour, the 2016 study, the most recent study, um, which w where we basically cobbled together what monies we could find, so we we accessed whatever remaining research funds we had in our pots. We collaborated with RTE. We got a little bit of funding from the Oireachtas, I think from, I can't remember, <coughs> one government department. We probably ended up having the guts of somewhere between 50 to 60,000 euro. And this was highly inadequate because, just to give you an, an, a sense of this, we had, an, a, a, as part of this, the RTE exit poll, where we got them to split the sample in three ways which meant we had samples of 1,000 each, but the questionnaires weren't able to speak across the piece. So we have some questions in one part of the sample that can't help uh, allow us to look at the relationship relating to questions in another part of the sample. And then in, in addition to that, we had two telephone polls we commissioned from Red Sea, 
and each of the samples of those telephone poles don't speak to the RTE samples, nor do they speak to each other. I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm going too much into the technical, mm. but effectively we ended up with five separate samples that don't speak to each other. And we were able to generate a volume out of that. <coughs> we just published a book that was pu published a few months ago with Manchester University Press, um, which covers a number of quite interesting themes to do with, you know, whether we're seeing the emergence of populism in Ireland. No, we're not, but we are beginning to see some hints of something along the way. But we'd love to have had better data to look at that properly, such as a, in relation to non-voters, because by the nature of the sort of data we had available to us, we could only really focus on people who are engaged in politics. One of, the, one of the most important things about an election study is you really want to tap those who are not interested in politics. You want to understand what, what, what drives those people and where, where potentially are they going in terms of their behaviour and attitudes. So that's the, that's the big constraint that we have in terms of the um, recent research. Again, Jane or Theresa might add a little bit more if, if I've left out anything. In terms of the Electoral Commission versus um, the Research Council, we've had several meetings now with the Research Council. <coughs> And I think the strongest thing that comes out from them is that because their budget is annualised, they, they say to us that they can simply not cater for an election study because we can't predict what, how many referendums are going to occur or when the general election is going to occur and suddenly when the cost is going to fall on them. So they've sent us to other places and, and, and I, I tend to agree with you, certainly or whatever about my colleagues, the Electoral Commission could well be the vehicle um, for, for locating something like this. <coughs> Um, for an election study to run in the way that we think it should be run, it should be as open and transparent and widespread across the research community. So we've tried to do that in, in the 2011 and the 2016 studies where we had a large committee uh, of political scientists, new and established uh, you know, PhD students, postdocs, um, full-time members of staff, where people could come up with ideas for questions. So there was, a, there was an attempt to try and make sure that this was spread as widely as possible. The data is shared across the research community, and as you said in your own question, shared more widely. So those data are, are widely available um, f for people. Um, that's, that's dealing with some of your issues, but perhaps Jane or Theresa might want to add more. Um, I suppose, yeah, I'll just pick up on, on a couple of them in terms of kind of how the questions are decided. I suppose there are kind of three main components to the study. We, we often think about the kind of the values that people actually have, like the kind of fundamental views they have about the nature of democracy, about the political system. So there's a lot of questions asked along that dimension. Then we ask more about kind of attitudes, kind of some more surface level questions about policy issues of the day, um, and, and also some kind of international questions related to global trends. And we also have questions that are focused on people's behaviors. Um, so, you know, um, how do you engage with politics? How interested in politics are you? Um, you know, how do you follow, follow politics? And then the analysis afterwards, uh, you know, combines these different components to come up with kind of deeper ways of understanding uh, the patterns of behavior and the trends over time um, in, the, in the political system. And in terms of how we, we communicate that, um, usually in a year after an election, uh, we have a little kind of roadshow for all of us. So I've been to Sinn Féin events, I've been to Green Party events, the Social Democrats, Fine Gael, Fine Fáil. So we, we engage fairly widely um, with the research communities, as well as making the data publicly available to anybody for them to, 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 to use it. And at the moment, we're also engaged in a kind of a, a separate process, which is trying to get all of the, the kind of partial studies that we've had in the past and put them in one place so that they'll at least be more accessible to, 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 to parties um, and to kind of interested civil and voluntary groups who want to, to want to use it. So that, that's one of the things um, that we're doing in terms of kind of uh, access at, at the moment. In, in terms of, of the best option, um, I mean, the funding is fairly modest. We're, you're, you're talking about, you know, a couple of hundred thousand euros here. It would just go up and down depending on whether there was an election in a given year or a referendum or whether there were two or three referendums coming together. So that, that's really what would, would determine it. So really, so long as it's kind of designed um, in a non-partisan kind of um, way with, with kind of serious academic credentials, the mechanism for the funding is, is mm. you know, somewhat agnostic on it. The data has to be available and there has to be integrity to the, to the design of the study. Just one supplementary question, the cost. Like if, in an ideal world, if there was a blank check there, what are you, what are you talking about in terms of, like, obviously, if there's a number of elections in a year, that's going to push it up. But do you have a notional cost per, per election or per referendum? Yeah. So would I, would I, that kind of speaks a bit to your, you know, what are, what are the options? 
So the kind of gold standard of these would be what's uh, called a panel study, which is what we had from 2002 to 2007. So you start off with several thousand people and then you follow some of those same people over the five years. So that way you get to see how at an individual level people are kind of changing. Um, and the, if you were to do a panel study, you, you might start out in kind of year one at an election, it might be um, what, about 250 to 300, that kind of amount, and then annually sort of 100. Um, and the same thing with the, um, a referendum study might be 120 to 150 to do it really well. So just, there's a, a number of kind of moving parts, but that's kind of the ballpark. I think the really important thing, just to reiterate what David and Teresa said, is that a lot of the time we've had to piggyback on RT exit polls. Um, and naturally by an exit poll, what you're doing is you're getting canvassers from Red Sea to stand outside various polling stations. So by definition, they can only capture people who've just walked out of a polling station. So all the people who never made it to the polling station, their views are never asked. We don't know anything about them. Never mind why they didn't turn up. We don't know anything else about them. And of course, those are the people who are most dissatisfied with democracy and things. And so I think it's really important that we actually understand uh, more about those people um, as well. And that's why it's really important to have an election study and not just piggyback on exit polls. Um, so that's a, the kind of the, the crucial thing there. And I think, yeah, like I'd agree that we're fairly agnostic where the, where the kind of money comes from. An electoral commission might be the right place. But like an electoral commission, it's one of, like it's an Irish perennial, isn't it? I know you guys are talking about it, but like, you know, when is it actually going to be? So I'd be kind of reluctant to say, mm. definitely put this through an electoral commission because, you know, who knows when that's happening. So maybe long term, that's where it should be based. But I think short term for the next general election, it should be the department who's, who's funding this in advance of uh, an electoral commission showing up. Um, I, it would be great if it was the research council, but it's really hard for it to be the research council because the elections and referendums, <coughs> we just don't know when they're gonna be, um, as you guys know really well. So I think for the department to have a funding line for it um, until the electoral commission is established is really the, uh, the only kind of answer. Um, and then in terms of the kind of questions, so obviously there's a lot of best practice. You want to make sure that you're asking questions in a way that you're not trying to lead people to certain answers. You know yourselves, like if a big brand was asking a question, the, the survey answers always come out in the, the way that favours them. So we have to be really scientific and really particular about that um, and follow kind of the way questions are asked internationally and the way we've asked them previously so we can compare but there's absolutely no reason why there shouldn't be wider consultation about the kinds of questions. So, you know, if um, this committee wanted to have some sort of involvement with the kind of issues that they thought might be interesting to be asked, there'd be no reason why, you know, we <coughs> wouldn't engage in, in that kind of a way. Obviously, the actual wording of the question would have to come down to, you know, scientific best practice and so on. Uh, but there's, there's no reason why the kind of input into the questions shouldn't be, um, you know, wider than uh, it has been in the past. That would be my view anyway. I don't know which, what David and Theresa think about that. Um, because the really important thing is that this is actually about our democracy and, you know, everybody in this room, but everybody outside of this room as well has, has an actual stake in that. And um, we all want to understand where it is. We want to understand where the people are. We want to understand why Ireland has been so successful, like why are we one of the, the few countries without you know, a radical right-wing populist party when we see this happening elsewhere. And we don't understand completely why, why that is. And in order to ensure that you know, it doesn't happen, we need to understand why it is. And uh, so I think you know, everybody's kind of got a, got a stake in that. And so I think you know, having it broader is, uh, is, is really important that uh, you know, we really understand the state of our politics and why and what, what people are doing. And uh, yeah, I think in the meantime, the department has to own the budget and uh, that way it <coughs> might even be for who knows when the next election is, but you know, it should be in place for that. And an electoral commission won't be in place before the next election, I'm sure. Deputy yeah. Barry wants to. 
Well, I just say at the start that I am a supporter of um, a properly funded um, democratic audit process, which isn't ad hoc, um, which is in place uh, on a permanent basis. Um, I think this is a democratic issue because if you don't have uh, a public um, process, you, the only process you have is private, and there are private process, processes. Uh, you're left with um, corporate media uh, and big political parties um, being the only forces in society uh, which gather, analyse and process uh, the data. So from the point of view of um, genuine democratic approach, uh, there has to be public funding uh, for this. Um, in fact, it's undemocratic or anti-democratic uh, if it isn't uh, in place. Um, I'd be interested to know this question as to uh, what are the countries that have best practice in the opinion of the panel in relation to this and which are the countries which lag behind. Um, one of the reasons I ask is that I think this issue is a little bit of a litmus test. Uh, I suspect that the societies that don't fund this are societies that lag behind uh, on other democratic litmus tests. Uh, and the ones that fare better on this front are ones where governments have put in place or have been forced to put in place um, uh, more um, um, democratic rights, more democratic uh, measures. So I'd be interested to know which are the countries which are advanced in this and which are the ones that lag behind internationally. Um, i just make a comment on that as well. Is I, I think it, it is a, a poor reflection on the Irish state and the approach of successive governments that you have people who are um, clearly extremely well qualified, professional, um, you know, can stand up in an international forum and hold their heads <coughs> high, who are forced to go around with begging bowls and scrambling uh, to get snippets of information from one group here and snippets from information one group there in order to put forward a, uh, um, um, an overview analysis of elections and referenda uh, in this country. It's, it's poor, it's amateurish, and it's reflects badly on the state uh, and on successive governments that professionals and people who have these skills and abilities uh, are, are forced to, to scramble around uh, like that. And th there's a question there for the panel as well is, you know, just be interested in getting a little bit of a flavour of, of what it's like uh, having to go around scrambling for those uh, bits of information in order to give, uh, to put forward a, an overview. Uh, in relation to uh, in relation to that, do I have another point here? Uh, yeah, it, 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 I don't know whether you know this is a, a, a guesstimate, but it, it struck me as interesting that funding was in place between 2002 and 2007, when the economy was booming, uh, and then during the austerity uh, uh, period that it wasn't the case. It, it perhaps points towards the idea that this is seen as a luxury. That, oh, well, when we can afford it, we'll do it, and, and when times are tougher, well, it's not a priority and it'll go by the wayside. This, this should be a permanent thing, irrespective of the current economic climate. And the, oh, yeah, the final point is I, I think a really important point has been <coughs> made about the issue of people who don't vote. Right? Um, I mean, we will, we, we will have experience. Um, as people who go knocking on doors of this, you know, where there is something which people feel really strongly about, we saw this in the abortion referendum, people who traditionally don't vote, uh, including the young, 
They see a reason for it. Um, but for a variety of reasons, but in large measure, I think, because the big parties are seen as, you know, it's, it's, it's the same menu that's being offered. A lot of people are, are switching off. Uh, and it's really important to get feedback and information which goes beyond the anecdotal, uh, which gives an insight into what people are saying, what people are thinking, uh, and not just the people who are coming out to vote. I think that's a really important point. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, Grace. Presentation, um, and I absolutely agree with the both the contributions from my colleagues here. Um, the Green Party are very supportive of evidence-based research that will um, enable and provide information to allow our democracy to develop um, and to um, yeah, just uh, give us the information as makes us with regard to the, those who don't vote and, um, and the younger voter. And why do some people come out for one referenda, maybe not another? You know, so it is really important that this um, research is enabled and carried out, but in an independent way. <coughs> and that's my first question, is um, in terms of how do we ensure that the research is um, independent and that... Um, uh, yeah, just fundamentally, it's independent. It's not skewed in one way or another um, in support of whoever's funding it. Um, and then, um, in terms of um, the younger voters, I mean, it, it's really important um, in a, a, I, I, in a, a strong democracy that uh, younger people come out to vote and why are they disenfranchised or whatever. So I, I just wonder is there research in other countries where there's more success with regard to bringing um, younger voters um, to, the, to the ballot box. Um, and as you said, if not, it is absolutely important that we know why they're not coming out. I would be interested in your view um, with regard to the voting age, you know, in terms of, of uh, the voting age at 16. And would you, from your uh, research, uh, would you, so far would you uh, have findings that support uh, younger people coming, um, it, it, uh, being enabled to vote? And I had a, a, just a short discussion now earlier with uh, Senator in about this, you know, that kind of apprentice uh, opportunity from the age of 16 to um, to sign on the register and that. So I'd be interested in that. And further, um, we had I was part of the Shannon Reform Implementation Group, and the findings of that um, are the the outcome was um, issued just before um, December, and one of the uh, recommendations was um, that there would be a commission set up um, to uh, um, acknowledge the, the voter base and a register. Uh, and I just wondered, could there be something done there in terms of coordinating um, like a, a commission um, that just covers the whole area uh, that wouldn't be exclusive to Shannon? So whatever monies that might be considered putting aside for a Shannon Commission, could that be, maybe, could we look at that more in the general term of having a, an overall commission in terms of uh, register of, of electors? Thank you. Victor? Just really the one, the one point I want to make. First, I want to thank you because I think you've done a really important piece of work. And we saw in advance of the meeting, you know, the, the, the Irish National Election Study that you were involved with. I suppose in your submission you raise a number of issues and you talk, and I think that's important to acknowledge, you say that, 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 that the submission states that although Ireland scores consistently high in integrity audits of Ireland's electoral process, areas of concern have also emerged specifically in relation to, shall we say, election registration process, political finance, which I don't particularly want to go into because that's a, a whole, you'd need a week for that. But more importantly, you talk about access, your concerns about access to the electoral process for women and minorities. 
and, and that's profound. And we, we, we keep hearing this theme about access to women and particular segments of the electorate in terms of, I suppose, equal access to, to, to the opportunity as well, because I think that's important as well as, you know, following it through. It's equal access to the opportunity, but engaging with the political <coughs> process. So you talk specifically about women and minorities, and you might just elaborate as well as the women, but more, more, I'd like to hear more as well also in relation to these minorities. And what do you mean by that? You might tease out some and give us some examples to, to demonstrate your concern. Do you want to start off there? Um, so, uh, examples uh, to take up on, on, on Deputy Barry's uh, question. Um, Ireland's actually pretty unusual in Europe in not having a permanent study. Actually, nearly all of the, um, the member states um, of the European Union do both both new and old member member states. So th there are different models or different ways of, of doing it. Um, so for example, Finland is, is a, a really good example. Um, the funding is managed by the Ministry of Justice in Finland because they're responsible for handling the electoral process. And they put out a, a, a tender, and it's actually a, a consortium of political scientists, usually based at all of the universities in, in Finland, that tender uh, tender for it. Uh, and that's how it's, it's funded. And that actually gets to Kind of one of your points as well is that one of the ways of ensuring the kind of independence and integrity of the of the study is to manage it in that kind of an open and transparent way um, either through something like an electoral commission or the Irish Research Council um, has partnered with uh, government departments uh, the constitutional convention in various different ways and actually um, carried out <coughs> funding has come from the government departments um, but the actual management of the process and the recruitment of the researchers has been carried out by the Irish Research Council because effectively that's what they do all the time and they have all of the processes and procedures in place uh, to ensure the integrity of the process. They have lots of international peer review and evaluation and I think that would be a, a one way of, of uh, guaranteeing the kind of independence and integrity uh, integrity of the, the study. Um, uh, Austria is another very good example of, of how they manage the, the process. It's a very, uh, very well run um, and, and well funded uh, study. Switzerland might also be interesting from our point of view because it's a place where and strangely enough the the referendum study has much higher priority than the election study and a lot more funding is allocated to the referendum study and they have a very interesting uh, procedure for, uh, for for doing that so we could we could also give um, give kind of um, examples uh, and, and highlight some some data from uh, from there um, just one of the questions was was asking about kind of how, how the, the study changes and, and involving people I just want to give some kind of concrete examples that might be, be useful for you um, in relation to kind of what kinds of questions we ask and why we ask them. So, for example, in 2011, we asked lots of questions about um, the political institutions. Um, about uh, people's value, views on the Dáil uh, and on the Shannad and on political parties, um, their views on public representatives. We asked lots of questions about how they engaged with their public in, in representatives, on what kinds of topics and why they engaged with their with their their public representatives. Um, so th this would be information that you'd imagine would be of, of interest to to uh, all political parties and, and people from from uh, no political party background as, as well. And, and another one that might be um, just worth mentioning, of course the social media and we started to ask um, many more questions about that in, in 2011 uh, and again in 2016 so um, what kinds of information people get from social media whether they trust uh, social uh, social media kind of how they use it during political campaigns is that different to outside of the uh, the political process and there's a public consultation process taking place kind of separately in tandem at, uh, at the moment that's looking at the role of kind of the online digital medias and how that's interacting with our democratic processes and that's part of a global <coughs> debate um, uh, that, that's happening um, you know it was being discussed at Facebook by, by Cheryl Sandberg yesterday so we do have some data on there but again it's it's quite limited but you'd imagine that this is a part of the election study that's going to grow and become more significant in terms of understanding how digital media is interacting with our um, with our, our democratic process um, I'm not sure if I'll hand over David, to David, you can, can I add a, a few a few things um, <coughs> I mean, so there are countries that don't have it. Greece would be a very prominent example. Uh, and it was so frustrating for our colleagues in the political science community in Greece during the crisis that they were unable to track what the hell was going on. Whereas we, at least with a bit of funding, we had had some sort of sense how voting was, was panning out in 2011 and 2016. So that would be a prominent example of, of, of bad practice, if you like. Um, 
when we when we cobble together the funds and we we're begging and borrowing and stealing from everyone we can to to get a little bit of funding we could in 2011 and 2016 this would end up with in conversations and i won't name the agencies but there'll be conversations with an agency where they will say okay we will give you some funding towards this but we need you to ask a bunch of questions so that if we get chased by public representatives or others about spending our budget on things like this we need to be able to show the questions that matter to us are being asked and unfortunately that means we end up asking questions that are of no use to us whatsoever so we have a number of questions in 2011 and 2016 that we don't make any use of but we had to do that so we could get a few other questions um, in there and and then so why why it's so important to go after non-voters you know so the the practice you'll find in a well-funded election study in another country is that that is the, the sampling is so so important how you do your sampling a newspaper opinion poll will use an existing panel, they, their, their polling agency will use an, ex, an existing panel of respondents to um, you know, track what is going on in terms of their voting behaviour. And by definition, their panel of respondents are interested people in politics more likely to vote. In a, in a properly funded election study, you are specifically going out to try and find people who are very hard to find in a normal public, uh, private opinion poll, because you really want to track those who are disinterested in politics. So big emphasis is on that, and we just have not been able to do that since 2007. Um, in terms of how can we make sure that this thing is done properly in a truly independent way, Teresa's already made one comment. I mean, there are others. As social scientists, as scientists, as academics, we are required to follow ethical procedures. We have to get ethical clearance for any research that we do in advance, which would specifically include survey works. So we have to abide by certain ethical standards. We have to declare any interests, any conflicting interests that we may have. To get the funding, we will have had to have a, a, judge, a judgment from our peers to make sure that they're satisfied that this is meeting the best international standards. And ultimately, as academics, we want to publish our research. So that goes through a peer review process. So if we're writing anything substandard or in any way something that doesn't meet good scientific rigor, it will not get published. So, we, you know, we, 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 we would have to abide by those sort of standards. Um, you asked a few, a few other questions, particularly about the votes at 16. This is where the Austrian election study has been so useful, because when Austria moved to votes at 16, they were able to focus their election study that followed on that, on the votes at 16 and, and how it impacted in terms of voting behaviour. Um, and so I'm, I'm a very strong supporter, personally, of votes at 16, and there's good political science research that demonstrates that that's a better age to track, to trap, to you know, get voters for the very first time that they have a chance to vote. You're more likely to get people to engage in the voting pr practice in future elections if they start that early in their lives than at a later stage when they're 18 or so. So I think it's an extremely um, important development that Austria has taken and other places are looking at, and we should also, I think. Um, Senator Boyan asked about a few things, but particularly you were asking us to maybe say a little bit more um, about women and minorities. Um, there's a few dimensions to that, but I suppose one, one dimension I'd, I'd look at there, and this is perhaps more to do with the question of a, an electoral commission than, than what we're talking to you today about, but um, a well-run a well electoral process, a good, a well-run electoral administration would ensure that they do whatever they can to make it easier for people to vote. So that would include experiments, and we see this in other countries, experiments with being able to vote in advance of polling day, and providing information in different languages. There's a little bit of that here, but more of that could be done. And making it easy, easier for people with disabilities to, to vote. And if trying online voting, I know that's not necessarily the most popular thing here now. And but, but also trying other ways of voting than, other, than having to turn up at the polling station. So there are ways in which one could explore making the process of, of, of voting more easy. And that is just one small example of how one could address certain communities that perhaps are not so actively engaged in politics today. And Jane, do you want yes. <clears throat> um, So, um, two colleagues have said a lot, but in, in terms of, uh, you know, which countries have it, and I think, What's also important there is how they use it. So in some countries you might have it, but nobody in the political system ever really looks at it. So that's why I think it's really important if, if we do it, if it comes via this committee, then it's more of a public thing and it's something that I think what really matters is if politicians and um, parties and 
um, interest groups actually look at it and realise it's there and realise that it's a, a valuable resource to them. Um, in some countries, if it's just purely a kind of um, through a research council and then to academics and then our kind of publications, then it mightn't actually inform the uh, internal debate as much as it, as much as it could. So, um, you know, personally, I'd really like to see uh, all of you actually use it um, and bring us in and, and talk about it more. I think that that's uh, really important. And I totally appreciate the, the sentiment of running around looking for all this ad hoc funding because we're researchers and not salesmen, but, you know, we to go around and do a lot of this kind of uh, sales. So, yeah, I appreciate that, that, that point. Um, I think what Theresa and David have both said about it being independent, that that's the crucial thing. And um, the way that you do that is through peer review and through uh, multi-institutional. So we've got three different institutions here, UCD, UCC and DCU. So, you know, that's, um, I think that's well covered. And I'd agree with David about the, the voting age. Theresa's actually done some of the, the research into this, so she can talk about it more. But the crucial thing is that 16-year-olds are at home with their parents. And so when their family's going out to vote, they'll go out to vote. By the time they're 18, they might no longer be at home. And so they'll get into the habit earlier if, uh, if they start at 16 than at, uh, at, at 18. And um, in terms of the women and minorities and young people, part of it is, of course, making it easier to vote. But a large part of it is actually the numbers who might be on the register, we're not sure, obviously our registers are such a, are such a mess, but really we need to make it much easier to register. You know, adding your name to the register is not, uh, is not an easy thing. Um, and I know the, the students' unions, did, you know, put in kind of Trojan work about this in advance of uh, both of the, the marriage equality and the, and the eighth referendums. But still it was really difficult and there's so many and where you're on the register if you're a student, but just getting on it is tricky in itself, and it closes quite a bit in advance of the actual election. I'm not sure what the reason for, for that is. In, in other countries, you can add your name up to the day before an election, whereas here it's quite a bit in advance. So there's, you know, I think in terms of access, you need to think about that. And, um, but again, that's probably more for an electoral commission than for this, but it's just a a kind of a, um, a separate thought. So I don't know, Teresa, do you have anything more to say about the younger voters? Teresa's done a lot of work with the uh, Yeah, but particularly on the voting voters, age, yeah. like on the practical points about voter registration, I mean, Ireland's actually pretty unusual in having <coughs> voluntary voter registration. Most other European uh, countries actually have automatic registration. So based on your social security number, you're added to the electoral, uh, the electoral register. And, and that means that we have particularly acute issues around younger voters. So they're not eligible to go on the register until they're 18, but a lot of them actually leave kind of formal interaction with the state at that point, and many more of them move out of home. Um, so it's actually very difficult uh, to get young people registered in a systematic way. And yes, university and other third level colleges do do a lot of work but that still leaves a whole cohort of people often included in that group are some of the most socially disadvantaged um, people so so built in there is a kind of a cycle of disadvantage so one of the things that the voting age change would actually do is it would get people while they're still in school so you may or may not get to vote depending on the electoral cycle whether you at, you know at 16 or, or 17 but one of the things we could do is build a system of registration where you go on the electoral register um at uh, at 16 and it wouldn't actually take a referendum we could introduce it for local elections and, and european parliament elections straight away there are no constitutional impediments or barriers uh, to, to to doing that and i, I think that's where in terms of the practical considerations of actually getting people registered uh, to vote and then if you had an electoral commission you could begin more kind of systematic and sustained voter education efforts and those could be targeted at a wider group of, uh, of people. Now these are changes that would kind of I think they would, the evidence internationally is that they do have an effect, but they have an effect over a long period of time. So I don't think we would expect an immediate uh, transformation, uh, but certainly from um, election restraint, particularly in, in Austria, but also at the Finnish case, uh, it shows that that has over time uh, been helpful engaging with younger voters. Because to answer your more 
precise question about you know why do younger voters not participate on the same level the, the reasons are complex but there are a couple of things that are, are important one is is kind of how interested young people are in, in politics but intersected with how far they think politics matters to them how they see it as affecting their um, their lives and also their levels of knowledge about uh, about politics and again that's connected to political <coughs> education in schools so to to make kind of concrete policy in these areas you really need to have the evidence and you need to be building that evidence over kind of longer periods uh, periods of time but the general uh, international experience is that you know the more younger people are informed about politics and the more that they feel politics matters to their lives the greater the chances of them turning uh, turning out to, to, to vote and that is very connected to political education um, in in schools and access to the uh, access to the polls yeah. Um, David, you spoke about the elections of 2011 and 2016, and just in terms of local elections and European elections, have you conducted study in that area? Because I'm thinking, just Theresa, what you said, you know, about the younger voter and trying to, um, to, uh, to uh, involve them in the, uh, the process or educate them to um, the importance of voting. Um, and in the local elections very much, that's the thing that affects them at home and on the ground. It might be something that they see as, this is a reason for me to actually get out and vote for the local council. And then later that might bring them into the, the, the general and hopefully into the European. So I'm just wondering, have you conducted uh, research in that area? And are you talking about that being part of the, the overall process when you talk about doing your research, or are you focusing just on the generals? I, I mean, if I could, the, um, the point that Jane was making earlier about the panel study would lend itself to exactly this, because the idea of a panel study is that you can then dip in at any stage. So if, there's, if there was the local elections in May and we had an existing panel, then there was, there'd be no particular reason why we couldn't then go to the panel and ask them a series of questions around the time of the local and Europeans. So, all, all is possible, providing you have the panel basis um, there. And then the, the add-on cost for each additional uh, wave that you might have is, is really rather limited in, in the round. Um, but so far, no. In terms of local elections, I'm not aware of any studies. In European Parliament elections, there has been some work done by colleagues in Trinity. Again, it's cobbling together whatever little bits they can, but it's, it's highly limited. Yeah, there was work in the 2004 one because in that 2002 to 2007 we had the panel study and so that included the local and Europeans in that five-year period. So there's quite a lot of work that was done about that and to the extent that the European elections were second order where people, you know, voting on European issues or on national issues and these kinds of questions but we haven't been able to, um, to do it since uh, 2004 because the because the funding um, hasn't been there. The, the other thing I'd say about the, um, which is separate to this study, but it might feed into an electoral commission. In Norway and Finland, they have um, part of the, of the commission deals with, uh, with schools and they actually run um, official hustings in all uh, secondary schools during the period before the, before the elections. And then the students all actually vote on the same day so it's covered by the media, so sort of two weeks in advance of the election, you get to hear what, how the students have, uh, have, how the secondary school students have voted. Um, and it actually impacts on the debate and so on, and they can, they can see it coming in, it's run officially. Sometimes the, um, you mightn't have the, um, the national candidates going into all the schools, but what you'll find is sometimes they will into some of the bigger schools, but maybe the local election candidates or the European ones will go in and actually speak at hustings and debates in the schools and, and this kind of thing. So it's a, a really powerful way to um, bring home the kind of uh, debates that are, that are going on. So something like that could certainly be considered as part of an electoral commission to, you know, really try to... Um, bring home the importance of political engagement to younger people. Can I oh, I'm sorry, the last thing is, we know very well when people turn 16 because we cut them off from child benefit unless they're still in uh, education. So um, presumably we can uh, then add them to an electoral register. Yeah. Transfer them over. <laughs> <laughs> they carried out a, a mock election in a primary school in Tremor 
prior to the 26 election. Yes, and <laughs> um, no, actually, the candidate, there were the different parties and the young pupils had to present absolutely. The teacher went very well, you know, formally through the process and the children were elected and um, the candidate who won was the one who gave no homework and uh, ice cream on a Friday. So, ice cream on a Friday. <laughs> Just, just on a small aside, there, there were a number of mock, or there were a number of hustings uh, of candidates in the last general election in our own constituency, and there did seem to be quite an interesting correlation between the result of the election in the school and the tally results for the catchment area of of there. So, for example, in one particular area, an independent candidate who didn't get elected and fared quite poorly. His strong electoral base was in the catchment area of the school, and he came second. And that's you know so obviously that means you know school children at home they're listening to their parents they're picking all that stuff up, yes. mm -hmm. um, which is the, the yeah. Austrian election study actually kind of demonstrates that point particularly in relation to 16 and 17 year olds because it actually shows that young people are. They're not a kind of a microcosm that exists independent of society. Mm. That actually, they very broadly speaking, follow yeah. the trends and and a lot of the trends at the election. So when the 16 and 17 year olds were studied more closely, they very much approximated um, what was happening. So some of the discussions about the voting age at 16 suggest, you know, that 16 and 17 year olds are very radical and they might, you know, vote in, in you know, wild to the right or wild <coughs> to the left. But actually, the the, the, the case, um, the evidence that, that's been presented is that they very much uh, approximate the trends that you see happening across the board at those kinds of uh, those kinds of elections. So it kind of demonstrates why it's important to have this research to be able to kind of understand when you're making critical policy changes on something like the voting age and that it has to be informed by, by evidence. Okay, uh, just maybe just one or two questions I'd like to follow up myself. Just going back to the period of 2002 and 2007, when you did get, I think you described it as some funding, maybe not all the funding you, you got, and you did say, you clarified there that you did do the local elections in 2004 as, as a result of that. Are you looking at a similar level of funding or are you looking at, at more to try and achieve what you want to achieve moving forward or can you answer that question? And equally, what so far, I suppose, has your interaction been currently with the department? And how is that interaction going? You know, <coughs> what's the before we have the department in here? Might like to get your own view mm -hmm. in relation to yeah. your yeah. In, interaction with the department. Yeah. And I suppose, from my own point of view, and a lot of it has been raised already here. Like we the local, the register is a problem. Voter turnout is becoming a problem. You have a difference between a general election and a referendum. You know, referendum seems to get the young people engaged, their social issues, their issues they can relate to, whereas we seem to lose them then for the general election. And equally then, I suppose, you know, the local elections I think are critical that we, we do more survey and understanding of the local election, because I think that's where young people can see direct effect in their communities is through local elections. The work that local councillors do on the ground, just in relation to community stuff. and. Um, I have been informed here that there is a budget line in relation to the Department of Taoiseach's in relation to referendums. And maybe we as a committee could make maybe some proposal that we set aside some funding on that budget line to do some research as a starting point. Just maybe just a few quick observations there. Well, um, I think we might say that we kind of stiffed out the Department of the Taoiseach actually um, <laughs> earlier than the uh, uh, dealing with the Department um, of uh, Housing. Uh, so we, we have had some engagement with the, with the Department of Antishuk, um about what this might look like. And arising from that, then we've had other consultations with, for example, the Central Statistics Office and, and exploring possibilities about how maybe the election study or a referendum study could be incorporated with some of the other work they do. But again, uh, that... That, that avenue didn't really work out, partly because of the, the, the way, the timing of the, the referendum and election studies. They, they can't really be tagged onto other studies because they kind of have to happen at the time of the, uh, of the electoral event. So we have had, uh, for the most part, we, it's the engagement with the Department of Antishuk rather than directly with the, um, the Department of Housing. Although we have been involved in consultations in relation to the Electoral Commission, and, and there it's come up, but 
not in a kind of a more uh, a more systematic uh, more systematic way. Um, in, in relation to your earlier question, the, the funding from 2002 to 2007, I mean, there'd be a degree of inflation involved. Um, but, I but I mean, yeah. roughly speaking, you'd be roughly talking about the same kind same. of parameters. So that's the the only thing you'd really want to add is referendums, because referendums weren't included there. Um, did so it include local elections? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. that funding did include. Yeah. That funding included local elections. So it, um, there was a. What happened was there wasn't one in 2003, which there should have been. So best practice would be to have it annually, but that it was 2002, 2004, 2006 and 2007, so there was four years. And what happened, there was a panel in the first year, um, which was kind of door to door, which is kind of the best practice, because that's where you're going to get the people who don't vote, they're going to um, answer their door, you know, whereas if you ring them up and sort of say, you know, will you, will you do this survey on elections, if you're very disengaged from the political process, you're going to say no. You know? So it's easier kind of door to door. And then a sample of those would have been kept and then uh, surveyed by post um, again afterwards. And then fresh samples put in, so as, you know, to make sure that the, the numbers were kept up. And so that covered the local and the European elections in, uh, in that cycle. And I think it's really important, I think you're right, to, to cover the local Europeans because that's you know where the fundamental one comes and also there's a lot of uh, people living in this country now who aren't eligible to vote in national elections but might be in time and they're actually el eligible for um, for the local elections and there's a different range of candidates and different issues so I think that's really important so we obviously know when local and Europeans are you know those are kind of Fixed in fixed in time, so that's um, fairly straightforward to do. The referendums are more of a movable feast, and the uh, and the general election, obviously. So, um, but I think it's important to to do it each year. And the problem was with the Department of Taoiseach when the the kind of the the suggestion came when the CSO does a lot of this kind of research. The CSO has very fixed time, so you could easily have. A referendum or a national election and the CSO wouldn't be actually going to ask anybody any questions till three months later and sure everybody's forgotten why it is they voted a particular way or why they didn't or you know they all claim to have uh, one of the the things that worked really well in 2002 is normally when you ask people did you vote it, like 85% of people say yes and we know that 85% of people didn't <laughs> turn out <laughs> so um, there the, the ESRI that time, uh, so the ESRI actually did the, the questions in 2002 and they actually had access to the marked registers and they were able to tell who d did and didn't. So then you actually got a, a, a proper um, account. It was obviously completely anonymised before anybody like me saw it. Um, but you actually knew then who did and who didn't and you were actually able to look at... Uh, at different things rather than just relying on the self-reporting. So there's different kind of ways of doing it. But, you know, I think in summary, a kind of something around the parameters of the 2002 to 2007 budget. And then obviously there's been inflation in terms of how much polling companies charge to kind of do these things. Yeah. yeah just I suppose in relation to serving on the council for 12 years, we always every year put something aside for the local elections because we knew it was coming in five years. So it didn't hit the accounts yeah in one year. Yeah. So similarly I think what you're asking here is that whether it be general elections or local elections or referendum that some pocket of money be put aside on an annual basis that, that could sustain this mo moving forward. Yeah, and exactly. I'm not trying to put a figure on it but you are sort of saying the level of funding you did get between 2002 and 2007 is in there thereabouts taking inflation and everything into account yeah. would be a good starting point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And just on that point, yeah. maybe relevant to what we recommend, <coughs> in today's money, the figures that you quoted earlier, you're talking about kind of a setup for your new panel of between 250 and 300,000, and then around about 100, 150,000 for every election after that. Yes. I mean, that's yeah. really the, yeah. the ballpark. Okay. Yeah. Like, this is really small money. Yeah, but, but, yeah. but the benefit, I mean, I think, you, I mean, everybody here has, has made clear the support for it. The benefit in terms of, of the public value of the information far, far outweighs the, the cost. But that's something we can turn to in yeah. private session. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other members? Okay. 
Um, can I take this opportunity to thank the witnesses for coming in here today? And um, I now suppose that we suspend the meeting while we allow the next department to take their seats. So thank you all very much.
Jennifer, we're in public session. Part two of today's meeting is electoral and referendum reform. In our second session today, we will consider the topic of electoral and referendum reform. On behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome from the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government, Ms. Fiona Quinn, Ms. Barry Ryan, Mr. Barry Ryan sorry, and Ms. Emer Connolly. And just a note on privilege before we begin. I wish to draw your attention to the fact by virtue of Section 17.2.1 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of the evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualify privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to that effect. Where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or identity by name or in such way as to make him or her or it identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside of the House or an official either by name or in such way as to make him or her identifiable. I now would like to call on Ms Quinn to make the opening statement. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm joined today by my colleagues Barry Ryan, Principal Officer in the Franchise Section in the Department, and Emer Connolly, Principal Officer with responsibility for the modernisation of the Electoral Register project. Uh, we'd like to thank the Committee for the opportunity to brief members on the current electoral reform initiatives that are underway in the Department. And I will briefly outline the key elements of our current reform agenda priorities. In December, two public consultation processes were launched, and both will run until mid-March. One related to the proposed establishment of an Electoral Commission, and the other is seeking views on the modernisation of the Electoral Register. Turning firstly to the establishment of an Electoral Commission and some context. Firstly, the Government has made a commitment in its programme for a partnership government to establish an Electoral Commission. In addition, a number of reports on Electoral Commissions have been published over the years. However, the most recent report, and the one that is largely informing current deliberations around the establishment of an Electoral Commission in Ireland, is the report published by the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Environment, Culture and the Gaeltacht in January 2016. That report contains a series of recommendations regarding the establishment of an Electoral Commission, including functions that should be assigned to it. While there is significant public trust in our electoral system, it is expected that the establishment of an independent Electoral Commission will build on that trust and help bring better cohesion and coordination to the electoral system, thereby improving the administration of elections. Electoral commissions carry out vital functions around the world, and while their role may vary from country to country, generally they are independent bodies that oversee and support the running of free and fair elections, set performance standards, regulate and monitor political funding and election expenditure, manage the registration of political parties, conduct research into electoral matters, and develop and implement voter participation and engagement programmes. These are the type of functions being considered for Ireland's Electoral Commission. In December, the Department published a Regulatory Impact Analysis, or RIA, on the establishment of an Electoral Commission. The establishment of such a body will constitute a significant reform to the current regime, which has been in place since the foundation of the State, and it is therefore right and proper that we would dedicate sufficient time to allow interested parties to inform our deliberations and to input to that reform project. The RIA puts forward a number of options for consideration as to how an electoral commission might be established, including the functions that could be assigned to it. All inputs received as part of the public consultation will be analysed, and the content used to inform a preferred option for establishing an electoral commission, which will be brought to government for consideration. The closing date for receipt of submissions is Friday the 15th of March 2019. Separately, <clears throat> significant work was advanced in the Department in 2018 on a modernisation project on the Electoral Register, and in December, Minister of State Phelan launched a public consultation which is seeking views on a set of proposals. The proposals include the introduction of a simplified registration process, a reduction in the number of application forms, online registration as an optional alternative to paper-based registration, and the move from household-based registration to individual registration. Verification of identity through the possible use of personal public service numbers, PPSNs, is also proposed. The proposals arise from a commitment in the programme for a partnership government to examine the voter registration process. Chair, it is worth mentioning again that the current system has served us well and will continue to do so. However, the proposals on which we are asking people's views in the public consultation are aimed at enabling people to register in simpler yet secure ways. 
as well as removing an excessive number of steps involved in applying to be included on the electoral register. The proposals would further increase the register's ability to keep up to date with changing individual circumstances and therefore its integrity. Reducing the number of different registration forms, allowing people to register online and introducing a process of continuous or rolling registration would make the registration process much more user friendly and similar to the way people interact with other state services. Having a registration process that recognises and facilitates more frequent changes of address is crucial in maintaining an accurate register as efficiently as possible. In summary, the proposals for the establishment of an electoral commission and the modernisation of the electoral register represent two very significant electoral reform initiatives. The public consultations that are now underway in respect of both initi initiatives will run until the 15th of March. The outcome of the consultation processes will inform the development of detailed proposals for implementation and the Department is encouraging everyone to consider these proposals and have their say. Myself and my colleagues will be very happy to further discuss the electoral reform initiatives if members have any questions. Thank you. Thanks Fiona. Owen? Thanks Chair and, and thanks for the, the presentation. Um, our party will be making submissions to the, to the public consultations and, and we've long argued both for an independent commission um, uh, and a, a modernising of the register, so it's very welcome that we're moving in that direction. I, I'm not going to ask you any questions about the detail of that because obviously in, in real terms you can't answer that until after the consultation. The question I am going to ask you though is maybe a little bit unfair, but do you have a notional timeline from when the consultation closes to when, if the outcome is to be some form of an independent electoral commission, when one might come into existence. Now, I know that's subject to drafting of legislation and securing of government approval and whatever, but in the best case scenario, you know, could we be looking at a 12-month or a 24-month period from close of consultation to when whatever the recommendations accepted by government are implemented? Do we have a kind of a timeline, I suppose? So, I suppose the, the, the um, document, the RIA, sets out a number of options. So, really, I think it probably depends on which of those options is selected or a combination of options maybe. So for example, if we were to look at one of the options which suggests that you could establish an electoral commission on an administrative basis first as a starting point and then move to legislate for it later. So then obviously you'd be able to establish one in a much shorter time frame. Mm -hmm. So obviously if you're looking at something that will require full legislative code to be in place before it's established, there would be a time period involved in obviously getting that legislation through the process, etc. So, you know, it, it'll really depend on the mix of options that, that is selected. Um, if, if it was a, a, a situation where it was <coughs> decided to establish it on, on an administrative basis, then you would imagine that certain functions could be um, assigned to an electoral commission in a relatively short time frame. And a supplementary question, when you use the mm -hmm. word a relatively short time frame, what does yeah. that mean? Um, I suppose then you It's be... months rather than years. Uh, yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, would, I would imagine so. The other members? I, to say, I just also want to welcome this and I think in particular um, including the functions that should be assigned to it because I think it is important and we've seen lately through different referendums and that that people will vote for something that they feel is so important to them in general and it, it is something that we all need to look at and you know I suppose long term we have to look at the picture years ago people died to vote so I think to vote and I particularly for politicians is probably something that we would uh, probably be promoting and say to people please go out and use your vote people have died for it so for me it's very important but the biggest issue is public consultation and you know yourself like people are very good and they have the best will in the world but actually getting submissions and actually getting feedback is going to be your biggest issue and I see the deadline is the 15th of March, uh, was, the submission is, was on Friday 20, uh, 2018. Like submissions, how do you find that? Do you find that is one of your serious issues that you feel going forward? Do you find that that is a big issue for you? Because I find myself, even if you, uh, you know, if there's a public meeting or even in general, just even with, if the council, we'd say, put, put things out on, you know, for, for um, consultation or whatever, people are not inclined to come back with good feedback or just in general feedback. How do you find, maybe you could come back to me on that. But overall, I want to welcome this. I think it is good. I think timescale is excellent. Um, but I just want to know what was your feedback or what do you feel will be the feedback that you will, you know, feel that you might gain from all this from people? 
Uh, thanks, Senator. Yeah, I think actually the, the consultation is open to the 15th of March 2019. 2019, yes. yes actually, I, know I read that and I said to that. myself, hang on there now. You weren't listening, though. You weren't listening. Did I read that wrong? And then I said 2018, yeah. 2019. I said, no, it couldn't have been in already. <laughs> there, was a, there was a small Yeah, you had there, to print an error. An important one, exactly. An <laughs> and I'll tell you, one. it's something you have to be so careful absolutely, on, though. Absolutely. And I was going to say 19, I stuck back and I said, yeah. oh my God, 18 is there. I better watch what <laughs> Okay. She, did, no. she did stay 19 on the record. I, I did. No. Yeah, but Correct. it's on your thing. It was 18, and I read 18. You see, that's yeah. how I was wondering. Yeah, no, you... and, and, yeah sorry. And apologies yeah. for that. No, you're uh, okay. And certainly, uh. just to be clear, it is 2019, and I mean, I think you know, uh, we launched them both in December. Interestingly enough, we've had uh, we've had some we've already had a flurry of, of responses, particularly in relation to the electoral uh, register reform, which obviously mm. really uh, people are interested in because it impacts on them personally. Um, I think you will see now in the, in, over the next month or two, you know, uh, a kind of a, a ramping up of our activity to try and make sure that people are aware that uh, the because I don't think they are now, to be honest. It's, and it's, it's, yeah, certainly to say the electoral, the electoral register one, we've already had quite yes. a, a number of responses. So, so I think um, you know again maybe because it impacts on people personally, but I think that uh, you know you'll see us ramping up our activity to make sure that we publicise it as much as possible. Okay. I think in general, in relation to consultation. Um, you know, it is it is challenging, it is difficult, but you know, I suppose that's one of the that's one of our challenges, I suppose, for us to try and make sure that we get as much uh, as much feedback as possible. We certainly will be looking at stakeholder consultation as well, so that we get particular interested parties who we know have already expressed views and get their views from them. So, um, certainly, uh, we will we'll be trying to make sure that we get to as many as many people as possible. And the local authorities are in assisting us in relation it's to so publication yeah. of, of yeah. the consultations around the country as well. So, I think that that'll be very helpful. Okay, that's grand. I'm glad I got that clarified. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> I was wondering, do you have a figure on those registered in terms of those who are um, eligible to vote, what the percentage is that are registered? And then um, I'm also wondering, uh, have you ever considered just automatic um, registration at the age of 18? Um, and then the the individual would then have an opt-out mechanism mm -hmm. because to my mind um, and to um, what I hear and see is that the, the system so far has, quite, has been very inefficient and that um, you know, we really need to um, energise and exercise um, as many people as possible to vote in a democracy. Um, and I know you, know you have to have that mechanism to bring them to the table. Uh, so I do think that there is a timeline up to the 15th of March where I would really hope that the department would use everything at your disposal to encourage people to, uh, to register because we have the local and the European elections coming up and um, you know with the uh, rise of digital media and that that you use not just the department's website but maybe Facebook and Twitter and everything at your means because that's a, an Instagram if it takes that you know it, in order to encourage people to to, to register and um, as I said I, I find this system um, in terms of uh, applying, it's <coughs> quite uh, inefficient, uh, it's quite unattractive to umber, umber peop, other younger people. And I say that as a mother of a 19, 21 and 27 year old, you know, so I've seen um, the, the lack of interest in going forward. Uh, so, so without the parental push and shove, you know, the individual mightn't have bothered. So everything that the department can do to encourage uh, individuals to register would be really um, uh, um, appreciated. Um, and uh, not just registering, but why they should. Why should someone register? So just to remind people and that you, um, that you uh, use the means to uh, uh, also to push towards those who may, might feel disenfranchised. So it's not everyone, um, you know, that has uh, sufficient information to want to come and register. So whatever means possible to get people to come out, because that's how we're going to have a good um, uh, and strong uh, democracy. Um, Early, I just brought up the point of the Shannon reform. So we had um, the electoral, uh, the implementation group came out with some results. So I'm just wondering, have you considered the um, the outcome of the Shannon reform group, the implementation group, um, with regard to um, changes in uh, the uh, electoral system there and how that might 
be of use because it was suggested that there would be an, a, a commission, an electoral commission, and that, you know, how do you see that? Could it be incorporated into um, the new uh, commission as part of, or would it be something separate? Um, and then just, uh, again, we spoke about the cost of a, of a commission um, and um, the former uh, presenters suggested that there had been um, a budget for an electoral commission, or for research, sorry, that was conducted in 2002 to 2007. Um, and could there be um, funding um, to support evidence-based research to help in the uh, in the years ahead that the people would have access to independent uh, information um, to help them in their deliberations in terms of uh, upcoming elections. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Senator. I'll, uh, I'll do a few bits myself and I'll yeah. pass on to some of my colleagues then to, to, uh, to supplement it. I suppose in relation to the the, the challenge of engaging young people in particular, um, I think that's something that, uh, you know, in terms of the um, consultation on the electoral register reform that we have we have called out there, you know, that certainly we should be looking at the option of registering, provisionally registering 16 and 17 year olds, and that's something that could perhaps be done through a schools programme, uh, for example, and then giving them the option then, you know, to opt out when it comes to, to 18. So I think that's something that, you know, um, definitely merits consideration and something we will be giving consideration to as part of our work ahead now on the electoral, on the electoral register. Um, in relation to the, um, the question about research, um, and, you know, that certainly is one of the, and again, the Constitution on the Electoral Register um, sets out that that is one of the functions that you know should be considered in relation to the establishment of an electoral commission, and that happens elsewhere, as, as I'm sure, sure you're aware, um, in, in the world, so that you would have an independent body like an electoral commission that would um, carry out or oversee the carrying out of, of research in relation to, to electoral matters. So I would say that, you know, from, from our perspective, that's certainly something that we would be considering um, as part of the, the functions of an electoral commission. And that actually would be one of them that um, we would consider possibly might not need a legislative basis if an, a commission was to be established on an administrative uh, basis initially. So that's certainly um, uh, an area that, that we would be looking at in that regard. Uh, and I mean, in the normal course of things anyway, in relation to, to research, you know, we, we obviously would welcome um, all, all proposals in, in that respect anyway. Um, and obviously we have to be mindful of kind of public finance procedures, procurement, etc., etc. But, um, but certainly that whole space of research is one that, that we would see as being an important function of an electoral commission potentially. Um, I might ask uh, Barry to talk to you about the, um, and maybe perhaps the yeah. Shannon reform piece and perhaps mm. the register stats. Yeah, sure. So your first question is around the percentage of people who, who, who would be registered. There is no definitive percentage uh, of, of people who should be registered. The register is what it is and the numbers uh, on it are, are <coughs> who is registered to vote. Sometimes comparisons are made between the register and census figures. <coughs> Um, I suppose there, that always comes with a, with a health warning in that they are two different processes and census obviously takes place every five years whereas the register is compiled on an annual basis um, <clears throat> and the census is a particular snapshot of, of a particular night in question uh, um, um, so uh, it does come with a, with a health warning. Having said that, local authorities in compiling the register um, you know, uh, could indeed look at um, the census figures at electoral division level because they are published at, at, at ED level and compare them to their own registered figures at ED level and to see if there's any large discrepancies or indeed if there's a, if there's a question of over-registration in a particular uh, electoral division that needs to be addressed. So um, while there isn't a specific um, percentage, um, the best comparison I guess is with census but that does come, come, come with a health, health warning. Um, in terms of the Shannon Reform Group, yes, we've, we've just recently received the report, the, the, the hard copy report, so we haven't given it any great, uh, I think it was just last week, we, we actually received the, the, the hard copy report along with the, um, the draft bill that, that accompanies the report. So we haven't been in a position to give it any great um, analysis or in that, but we, we will obviously be, be considering it, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
just Deputy. sorry, just yes, sorry, sir. just I didn't uh, intend to encouraging people to vote. And yes, um, um, <clears throat> Fiona touched on um, uh, young young people, and, and, and you mentioned yourself. And I have a 19-year-old at home, myself, and some have experience of of, <laughs> of them uh, getting onto the register or being or being encouraged to get onto the register. Um, sure. We do we do run an information campaign. Um, every autumn in November when the draft register is being compiled, um, uh, encouraging people to check the draft register and make sure that, uh, that they're on it. Um, we also, and this is I suppose particularly uh, useful uh, as we approach local elections, we have information leaflets which are both distributed to local authorities um, and published on our website. And one of those leaflets focuses on the process of, of registration. Uh, and we publish them in 17 different languages. Um, so, um, and, and, and alongside that, we've been um, working with the Immigrant, Immigrant Council, uh, who recently published a series of videos encouraging people as, they, as we get closer to the, to the local uh, elections to, to register, and we've been working with them on those videos. And again, they publish those videos in, in a number of different languages. So there are initiatives that, that we do, and, and um, you mentioned social media. We are active on Twitter, uh, certainly with the modernization of the register, uh, um, that project and um, there's continuous tweets, yeah, there's continuous tweets on that, Emer, yeah. Emer, yeah. yeah. Emer, if you want to come in. Okay, thanks. Um, no, we're completely aware that we do need to have as much awareness as possible to get as many submissions, even though we've got a good initial, initial kind of batch of them. So our plans are to, as Barry was saying, we're tweeting every couple of days, and I think there's been good kind of retweets on that. We're also launching a radio campaign very shortly. We just were looking into that yesterday, how to reach the maximum... I suppose the maximum kind of um, outreach into it. We're also distributing posters to all the local authorities who are the registration authorities. They're also going to be uh, putting things up on their own reception areas as well. Uh, we're also going to be doing <coughs> sponsored Facebook and other social media tweets as well. And obviously we'll be seeing how else we can kind of like effectively reach as many people as possible through stakeholder engagement, etc. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jennifer, you want to come in yeah, quick, very quickly? Yeah, I will indeed. Sorry, and, just, and can I just on. ask you, you have here that separately significant work was advanced in the department um, on modernisation projects. So do you actually, can you maybe inform us on, on what, what that was? But can I just ask you, and you spoke about your son of 19 voting. The biggest issue is when you actually can't go into your local authority and hand in your form, um, to register to go on the on the list to vote you actually when the t there's always a deadline a few months before maybe two or three months before general local elections that you have to go to your guards barracks and you have to go with identification to the guards to get signed to get a form signed now I feel just an example of that I'm just giving this and you spoke about your son that is one of the the biggest deterrents that puts young people off going on the register and it's not that, they, it's just the fact of having to actually go into your local guards barracks, get it, get the time even to do it. So the whole time system, the form itself, like we need to be looking at PPS numbers. Like going forward, the only way forward is your PPS number and you hand it in. Okay, thank you. Because they did address that in the... Office. Okay, well just, but it can maybe... Also, back we'll we let them back in time. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Senator. Um, thank you. I think, you know, in terms of, the, this is kind of at the core of some of the issues we're looking at in terms of the electoral register reform. Um, so when the, the document says that there's been a lot of work done, and yeah. that's kind of the preparatory scoping work. So a project of that nature, as you can imagine, there's a really um, significant technical, uh, I suppose, input to it. So uh, we've been looking at, I suppose, all of the, the kind of potential um, methods that we can try and address these things, and uh, coming to your, your point of the PPSN, that, that's a that's a very good a very good example, and certainly that's one of the options that we have been looking at. So big, yeah. And obviously that has you know we've we've had kind of lots of consultations with local authority and the experts in the local mm. authority, so those who kind of run the franchise sections, um, and we've been kind of talking to the uh, in relation to the data piece. Then obviously there are data issues, I suppose data protection issues around mm. PPSN. So we're trying to just clarify all of those things. So that's the preparatory work I suppose that we've been doing, and then it has kind of led us to a series of proposals which you'll see in the document then as to yeah, the things yeah. that we should look at maybe in terms of trying to, to address it. In terms of the, the young people and looking at, you know, how can we better engage them in, in terms of registering. And one of the things that we have that we are proposing is that we would look at an optional online registration. Mm. I think probably for that cohort, that generation, yes. that's that's probably a method they would, would prefer, I would say, rather than the paper based. And I think we, there is balance, you know, so there will still be uh, people that mm. would prefer the paper based um, of course, yeah. and that's fine, we still have to, to cater for them. But then obviously, if we do want to look at optional online registration, that's something that, that we're proposing as part of the, the suite of options there. There are obviously, again, from our perspective, we need to balance the security 
<coughs> issues around that, and it's very possible to do that. So I think they're kind of technical issues that now we've been looking at and we'll continue to look at. So, you know, um, if somebody has, for example, um, have, has already registered for something, so say, you know, the... Um, the, um, what's the, the mygov.ie, mygov sorry, I couldn't remember. So, uh, you know, there are a few hundred thousand people that, that have registered for that already. So they've already gone through a process of verifying, verifying their identity. Right. So why not set up a situation where they can use that, that Continue they've already that. verified, yes. and they can manage the their information go. online. Yeah. I think young people in particular will probably, I definitely, will probably yeah. uh, be, yeah. be uh, interested in that kind of approach. Yeah. So yeah, they're all Thank things that we... Uh, that's a great role to take. And, 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 uh, thanks, thanks again, and thanks for the report and your work, and indeed something we lobby in the Rural Independent Group uh, in the programme, the talks for the programme for government, and we'd like to see that there's movement on it, because the, the, the situation at present is archaic. And, we talk from another aspect. When I see old people on every election who value their votes and they are knocked off the register and they don't realise until they arrive at the board decision they're not on it. And that's so inherently unfair and just I've seen tears and trauma and every election that I've been involved in since 1979 I've seen that happening. And that's very, very unfair. In some cases a whole street could be knocked off or a, or a household. And I think there must be some mechanism in a situation like that where people have always been on it and always lived on it and have always voted that when that's discovered, there should, some way, there should be some quick fix, you know, that they are representing, they're known by their presiding officers in many rural communities that they know them and, and know them well. <clears throat> and that's very unfair, and surely the system should be able to adjust for that. PPS number has to be used, <clears throat> that they can register online and register immediately, and the, the dates then, and the closures, and the supplementary registers, and the advertising, and so chaotic, and they miss it, and... I know why the situation came in regarding visit that get assigned by the garden station. We know why that happened, but look, it's unfortunate as well, but it did happen. And then, if I could turn to the whole fraud that went on, and some of it wasn't fraud, but in the last two referenda, there was a huge amount of duplicated voting, triplicated voting. I had a man contact me, he got five voting cards. Now, he didn't believe that it wasn't fraud. He said it was just uh, inertia. He registered every place he moved to work, and uh, it just happened. He had five voting cards from different parts of the country, and not, some of them not a half distance apart within 50 mile radius, and that must be true. And, and I want to salute the staff in Tipperary, South Tipperary House, especially over the years. They were very courteous and helpful. But in recent times, since the amalgamation, we haven't got the staff. And I was astounded this year. Just invariably, an election day or voting day, someone will turn up and they won't get a vote. And they'll ring uh, a, a politician that they know or whatever. And there was no staff on duty in Tipperary. You would refer to Waterford County Council. Uh, on the day of the poll, now, they had been busy before, and I accept that. I couldn't believe it. They were on leave or whatever. I'm not saying they were trying to leave, but it should have been organised differently. There were so many attendance calls from whoever met it, whether it was the citizens themselves or whether it was a, a, a politician's office. In my office in Clonmel, people just walk in. They've been down to polling booth, uh, and they come up, and they've no vote, and they're hugely exercised. And they make the effort to go to vote, and had a vote, and expect to have a vote. Hugely exercised over them. It's inherently unfair and hurtful to them when they make that effort. So I, I thought there's a serious deep analysis needs to be done as to why there was such inertia, such mistakes, such, you know, every election there'd be one street or other somewhere knocked off, a whole convent of sisters were knocked off the last time, you know, and they cherished her vote. <coughs> and I'm not saying this because they but anyway, I'm just saying it's knocked off. There was on had voted but I had I had a man at one stage, he was eighty eight, he'd voted every election since nineteen um, eighteen. And he was with support. He was devastated. Couldn't be consoled. And there must be some mechanism there at this modern day and age. I mean, other countries, we have to look at best practices in America, different people, they can register, uh, you know, up to 24 hours before the vote. Because it's the nature of the beast that we want people to be involved in politics. We want people to, to, to vote and be uh, exercise their franchise. But they must be made friendly towards them. And it must be made accessible. And it must be made... With all, with all the creative ideas of various politicians, of political parties and machines, it, it may be down to the last week before people get focused on you know, issues and whatever. So this needs a major overhaul, and it needs to be very uh, conscious of people that are greatly offended by the system that had had votes and were just unceremoniously knocked off. No sympathy, no empathy, no engagement, just tough, toughest, you know what. And then the massive fraud the last two referendums that are supposed to the line and everything else, Vote in different places, voting. I had a French student on to me who got a voting cab. She couldn't get a voting cab, but she got a voting cab to her, to her, to her, her place of her, 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 um, digs in, in, in Galway. I mean, that's blatant uh, abuse. And there wasn't a word said about it. It was grand. 
I mean, it's disgraceful. It's, it's criminal activity, and it shouldn't be tolerated. So it needs to be very tight, but it needs to be very reflective of, of, of people's views and feelings, and they have to be able to, as I said, if they're knocked off inadvertently, there must be some process that they can be uh, um, facilitated, because uh, they're not uh, trying to deceive anyone. Uh, they have their identity, they're known to the people, and just all of a sudden they're off it. So there's lots of questions and there's lots of deep research and needs. And I hope there'll be a good, um, you know, engagement with, with uh, consultation, but getting that out there is the problem. You know, it's, it's, it's getting it out effectively. Like, all consultation is not easy. <coughs> I'll go around and I'll come back to you, Deputy Barry. Just listen to the stories Massive, massive fraud in the last referendum, you know. I wonder if Deputy McGrath is going to be like those Japanese soldiers who are still coming out of the jungles 30 years after the re referendum, still trying to refight it. But anyway, I'll... I'll, 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 I'll I didn't address Deputy Barry, and I didn't address him either. I addressed the chair and put questions to our guest. He wants his toss guy to speed all the time. He can have him, but I'm not going to listen to his diatribe. Well, you don't have to. Oh, Deputy Barry. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll park it there. Yeah, um, please. Might as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to um, uh, focus on one issue because there's there's uh, there's a lot of issues here, but I'll, I'll just focus on one issue, which is the one that we had the, the group in about earlier on, right? Uh, they were making the case for uh, what they described as a permanent democratic <coughs> audit process, uh, and I have to say I strongly support uh, what they argued for there. Uh, they gave the example of European uh, countries like Finland, like Austria, like uh, Switzerland, where there is permanent funding for research and surveying of uh, election results, uh, referendum results, um, uh, social attitudes of people who don't vote, etc., etc. Um, I'm convinced that this is something that would be uh, very beneficial uh, for our society. Uh, I think that if you don't have funding for that, that it's done by private organisations like corporate media and big political parties and isn't available to, you know, the mass of the people. Uh, so there's a democratic issue there. And it would seem to me from the information that was given earlier on that this can be done for relatively low sums of money. All right? uh, so I think this is something we should prioritise. Uh, I think this is something that we should get in line with international best practice. I think this is something that we should make provision for funding uh, on an annualised basis uh, for. Um, there are some details that would need to be worked out as to exactly how you would do it, uh, but the principle is something uh, I strongly support and it's a point I just want to register in this discussion. There were other points I, I would like to make about the register, but I'll leave it at that. And okay, Victor. Submission and sent it in here, so uh, I think it makes for interesting reading. And I don't want to dwell uh, really too much on the past, but I don't necessarily want to look too much into the future because I think from both our deliberations with both panels today, clearly there's something's going to happen. Uh, and there's a commitment in the program of government for establishing some sort of electoral reform. And I think there was a genuine commitment to look at it. How that happens is another day's work. But I'd just like to bring us into the current present. Uh, I saw a statutory notice in a local paper which related to my own local authority of which there was an application being made to the registrar to strike off uh, a, a number of people. This, it just so happens the same day I received from an elderly woman of 80 years of age to tell me she had received a letter to say that she was no longer uh, registered at that address or able to live there. The woman had lived there for 48 years. And what actually happened is her son had come to live with her and his wife, and they had put an extension onto the house, and they joined the register. So what the local authority took presumed that the older person or the other person had either died, but there was, there was a presumption, there was no basis for it. And I was initially told, uh, sorry, that they'd have to make an application, there's, there's a process, statutory notice goes in all the papers. I would have seen it in Carlo, I would have seen a number of them in, in provincial papers as well, where they were advertised. This exercise would have only happened in the last few weeks. And, um, after making a bit of a fuss, they reluctantly, reluctantly have to say, it was a bit of an effort, said, oh, look, okay, we'll, we'll put her back on, but technically she should be now making the case that she's, or giving evidence that she's there. 
So the whole thing is a mess. The electoral register is in a mess. I then made some inquiries of a number of local authorities who told me they have no obligation, they're not obliged in law or any other basis to go out and do outreach anymore. We used to have people who do call calls on doors and, and samples and say, would you come on or check in. None of that's happening in local authorities. They say they have no funding. Yet a number of budgets I looked at provide some funding for this. So the, the line of funding needs to be clarified. Is there money from central government in, into council's budgets for it, or do the council set aside money for it or whatever? But we have a situation where effectively it is not a priority for the 31, the most of the 31 local authorities. Uh, and that's an issue that I'd like you to address immediately. And perhaps when you go back to your office today, that you might raise that with the head of the franchise or the various people involved in the franchise. Because I think franchise section within your own department, because I think there should be a circular issue to all of the 31 chief executives clearly stating that they should be obliged to get out there and engage. And if it's a resource issue, let's address the resource issue. But let's hear why local authorities are now not engaging doing field work, door-to-door -door work, because I think it's an important aspect, or some other form of work. But I think we need a situation. And we will have an election perhaps in the, We're definitely going to have a local election in, in a few months. So this, this work is important. So I would, I, I would ask that somebody would give a commitment here today to engage with the chief executives of the 31 local authorities this coming week to say, look, we want you to prioritise within your budgets or assist them with additional budget or funding to prioritise to clean up our registers of electors because they're totally outdated. I know people who are dead who are still on the register 10 years later. There are other people that are duplicated on the same register within the same local electoral ward. And I think it's incumbent on us to clean up and have the register as clean as possible particularly going into now two elections in May. Thank you. Owen, you want to ask a quick supplementary? Yeah. It's just to pick up on Deputy Barry's question. Obviously, you caught the tail end of the, the, the political scientists' presentation, and, and you know them all well. Uh, my question is not in relation to the consultations and whether or not we get an electoral commission. It's while we're waiting for that, is the department and your section actively considering whether or not to fund some form of electoral research this year and next year, um, while the bigger issue of a commission and whether or not that is tasked with funding research on an ongoing basis um, uh, is decided or not, because obviously we could have a general election plus a number of referendums uh, uh, this year next year. We have local and European elections this year, so obviously if some funding was made available, uh, um, I think you've probably got a sense of the committee's views <coughs> and we can correspond with on this. There would be strong support from this committee for that. Okay, we'll go back to Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, everybody, for your questions. Um, I'll let Barry deal with some of the issues, um, particularly in relation to the register. I suppose I might just make a couple of general points around it. And you know, I mean, from, from our perspective, um, certainly, you know, we accept that the register could be improved, and that's obviously why we're uh, promoting this this uh, significant project that uh, that we are and that we're dedicating um, uh, our, our resources to as well. Um, I suppose, you know, in terms of um, people coming on and off the register, and Barry, <clears throat> Barry will be able to talk to you a little bit about this because he engages on an ongoing basis with the with the local authorities. You know, the, obviously it's a, it's the local authorities' function to manage the register. Um, so, um, like from their perspective, then they they utilise whatever they feel are the necessary steps to do so, and that will include uh, certainly um, going around to. Uh, to door to door uh, where they feel it's necessary. I, I can't obviously confirm that it happens all over the country, but certainly it happens. Um, and uh, certainly, I know from my own uh, from my own experience, um, they certainly call to my door uh, in, in, within the last few months. So it certainly does happen. Um, and I think you know, f from all of our perspectives, I think you know there is an onus on individuals to make sure that their information is up to date on the register as well. Um, you know, I suppose they, we don't have any significant indications that there are problems with fraud and I think that the um, electoral register and the process is well respected and generally held in very high regard in, in this country. Um, obviously for people, if anybody um, does behave in a fraudulent manner then it is an offence and they should be prosecuted and I think that it's important that those mechanisms are utilised by people that have that information. Uh, from our point of view it is not a significant issue and while we certainly accept that they're the, the uh, register and in particular I think the fact that maybe there are not unique identifiers attached to people's information can lead to duplications on the register. I think that doesn't necessarily mean then that people will behave in a fraudulent manner and vote. And as I say, we don't have any, any significant evidence to, to support that. Um, I think, you know, in terms of what we're trying to do to, to address it, um, 
some of the uh, um, some of the options that we've outlined uh, in the in the consultation will we'll look at trying to address some of those issues uh, so that, that the situation improves and it becomes a more up-to-date um, and more efficient uh, method of managing that information so you know um, if we are looking at kind of data sharing with uh, say in relation to you mentioned say somebody might be deceased for example mm -hmm. so it should be possible for us to consider trying to get that information which another part of the state already holds mm -hmm. and update the register automatically so that therefore and i know that that can cause upset to people if they receive voting cards maybe for for somebody who's deceased and so i think that that's that's an important an important activity that uh, that we can certainly uh, we can certainly look at and um, you know in relation to older people and that comes back to a point that, that i made you know we absolutely recognize that while a lot of younger people in particular would be very interested in managing their information online and in a you know a, a timely fashion so they can go in they can on their phone they can log in whatever point they want and update their address if that's what they need to do we still we recognize that there is another cohort of people who have voted for their lifetime and we need to make sure that we provide for them as well in whatever system we set up going forward and um, you know in relation to the register you know from from our perspective and from the discussions we have with the local authorities people are not taken off the register <clears throat> without there being a number of steps involved in that process. Um, I might let Barry talk to you a little bit about that. Maybe you might go into a little mm -hmm. bit more detail, Barry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so look, there's a couple of things. Um, uh, just to talk about, first of all, one of the initiatives in terms of what the proposals that are put forward in the modernization uh, um, uh, project is the idea of a rolling register. Mm -hmm. So in actual fact, what that would do was cut through, would cut through a lot of the issues that have been discussed here. It would cut through, there would not be no need at that stage for any supplement to the register if you had a continuously updated register and people could, could register. You could also have, so there wouldn't be a, a supplement, people could register right up until a particular point in time before polling day, which, which could be quite close to, 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 to polling day. Obviously, you need some uh, uh, gap to allow polling cards to issue and so on, but um, it could. So that would do away with the supplement. So therefore, by extension, that would do away with the issue that was discussed about asking people to go to a guard station and, and, and so on. So that's a key uh, point in terms of our, one of the key initiatives in terms of moving to a, to a rolling register. Um, in terms of... Um, Timeline, Senator, uh, you, you mentioned, um, you know, cleaning up the register before the, the local elections. I think it's important just to just to, to clarify what the, the, the legal status of it. The register is compiled on an annual basis, and that, that process starts, um, in fact, the previous summer to when the register is eventually published the following February. November is the time for the publication of the draft register and people to examine it uh, and, and make uh, claims and so on and, and make sure that they're on the register. Local authorities then um, uh, between the end of November and the beginning of February, as you say, tidy up that register um, and publish their register on the 1st of February each year. And that becomes effective, uh, I think it's the 14th of February, it becomes effective. And that's it, that's cast in stone. That register then, there's no question of removing or adding anybody to that register for, for the next 12 months. It's there, it's set. Where there is scope is in the compilation of the supplement to the register in the run-in to, a, to a, um, a, a polling day. So that's where we're at just at the moment is in terms of locals and Europeans, it's the compiling of the supplement, that's, that's the issue. The register will be, will be published in, in, in a couple of weeks. Um, in terms of door-to-door -door, uh, canvassing, uh, Fiona mentioned that it does happen. It, 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 it happens, some local authorities are more active than others, obviously, and still in, in the door-to-door -door space. What local authorities would say, in fairness to them, over the years, it's become more complex operation that, for example, access to gated communities and so on is not as straightforward as it, as, as it used to be. So the door-to-door the, the, uh, the -door canvas has its limitations, um, um, maybe, compared to many years ago when it was, when it was um, and, and that's why, and that's why, you know, one of the initiatives in terms of online registration, um, making it easier for people to, to, to register, um, and, and, and one of the key elements in that, whether it's a PPS number, number or not, is a unique identifier, and again, that would address the issues that I talked about in terms of excess and the register, or people being on the register a number of times if you move to, to, to a unique identifier. Um, Sorry, what was the question you asked me to? It was at the very start. Again, about people being taken off the register. Well, people being taken off the register, mm -hmm. yes. Local authorities, I mean, registration authorities do and should engage with people a number of occasions. I mean, 
uh, when it, before anybody is is it that, well. I mean, that's the, you know, there should be a number of engagements and, and local authorities should be able to show that there was a paper trail here and there was efforts to engage. And that would include uh, knocking on somebody's door to, to clarify who's, who's in the house or not. Um, and also writing to that person. Now, it is possible as well, no other person may not have engaged, may not be in if somebody calls and then may not engage with the, with the, with the correspondence that's left and, and, and they were taken up. But certainly there should be a paper trail there in a local authority to, sh to show why somebody was actually taken up. People shouldn't just be removed from the register for, for, for no reason, as you say, um, Senator, on an assumption. Um, um, it should be, it should be um, um, you know, evidence-based that, that somebody has is, is passed away, has moved on, or whatever the case might be, and will be removed. Um, I might just come back. I think the other question was from uh, uh, Deputy O'Brien and Barry, um, you know, in relation to the, the research piece in particular, and uh, we had a brief discussion uh, around this um, with Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, you know, I suppose from our perspective um, and elsewhere, certainly there, in the world, there, you know, there, uh, the electoral commissions do have this role. And I, I take your point, you know, what happens in the meantime until the electoral commission is established, certainly we would see it, uh, Deputy Barry, as being kind of, you know, um, one of the very desirable functions that an electoral commission would have, and then it brings an independence to it as well. Uh, they're able to um, manage that research uh, without, you know, any political involvement whatsoever, and they can report and hold uh, and report on the whatever topic they want to, a whole range of topics, whatever it might be about, um, in relation to election results or um, registrations or whatever, uh, whatever that the, their proposed topics would be. Um, I think, you know, from the department's perspective, um, you know, our prioritisation at the moment is uncertainly trying to progress these two initiatives. Um, if we move to a point where there's a policy decision taken that an electoral commission could be established on, as I said already, a non-legislative basis, we would see that happening within a relatively short time frame. So, you know, it could conceivably be within uh, 2019 and therefore some of the functions that are on a non-legislative basis that could be assigned, as we've set out in the, in the uh, consultation, could be around research and voter engagement and awareness raising. Um, I mean, in the, in the interim, certainly, we're always, we're always willing to, to, uh, to receive proposals. And as, as you mentioned, we are in contact with, with a lot of the, the, um, your earlier um, guests that you had. Um, so, you know, we, I suppose from our point of view, we're always willing to consider and we will um, certainly give consideration to anything <coughs> that they'd like to send to us uh, in the meantime. But, we would hope that the electoral, reg the electoral commission, I suppose, would, would move into that space sooner rather than later if, that, if those policy decisions are taken. So. Uh, Deputy McGrath. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I know, I'm not aware of any house visitation in my constituency. Maybe there isn't, and there is obviously none of us. And since the rent, local county rent collectors, you know, they had a huge handle on everything, and they, they were... Um, they also keep an eye on the house, but, but they, they, they did a lot of work in that area as well. But they're all gone with 10, 12 years now, I'd say. And I'm surprised to hear, I, I hear you right, saying that um, I know the process in November and then it's published on the 14th of February, and that's it, unless there's an election, there's a supplementary. Because I uh, regularly, and my office regularly, do send in people who have passed away. You know, we feel it, because we get a lot of trauma. You said it's not touched. Surely, are they not deleted yeah, then? Yeah, just to clarify that, and when people pass away, um, the, the process is that technically they're not deleted, but they, in terms of issuing a polling card to those people, it would be withheld, it uh, should be withheld. But, but I suppose technically from a legal uh, point of view, they're not deleted from the register. But as Fiona mentioned earlier, clearly it's, it's you know, upsetting the story for some people to receive a polling card when, when somebody has passed away. So every effort is made to, um, I suppose that's the one exception, to, to withhold a polling information card being issued rather than a deletion from the register. Okay, just bring it in and bring it back. A little short question. In terms of the, the statutory process where the public notice goes in and says we're going to take these people off the register, I, I gave you an example of the woman who only got no notice, only a letter a week beforehand. I have a copy of the letter on my desk and I contacted the authority. But do you keep any stats? For instance, I was asked, would the local authority, who keeps these registers? These are formally went to the register, there's a, a sitting, you can make a presentation. Who keeps these stats? Do you know, for instance, well, I, I can tell you I know, and some of them because I made inquiries, do you know the extent of the thousands of people that were struck off the register, that, these registers in the last few weeks? Would you have any idea of the numbers? Who, 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 who controls that? 
but keeps those stats because it is a statutory process. Mm -hmm. I told you that I went looking in a number of the provincial papers to see these statutory ads. Uh, I made representations to a number of local authorities. One authority told me there was over 1,400 that were being struck <coughs> off. Um, they told me that they haven't heard back from people, but there was no evidence to suggest. But in terms of the paper trail, where, who holds these? Can you just explain that process of where a statutory notice is put on a paper saying the following people, you get a letter, you're told, and if you want, you have to make a case, you, you, appear, you have to appear, uh, make, a, uh, make a representation to the registrar in relation. Who, so, could you just quickly tell us about that process, but more importantly, do you know how many thousands of people in the last two months have been struck off our electoral registers? Um, the, the, the short answer to that, Senator, is, is, is no, we don't, because we, what we compile is simply the numbers of people who are on the register. Uh, when it's published and indeed when uh, at, at, at draft stage. So when the registration authority publishes the register now in February, we will know what the final figures are on each of the registers for <coughs> presidential referendums, European, local electors and so on. But there's obviously a balancing figure there because there's people yeah. who have been struck off and there's people who have come onto the register. Yeah. Um, so while well, the figure, the overall figure may, may ultimately look the same. Maybe it doesn't show the full picture in terms of who's been, who, the, the number of adjustments or number of uh, mm -hmm. people who've been taken off. But certainly, the registration authority itself, the local authority who has responsibility legally for, for compiling the register would have those, those figures. Are they obliged to make them public? Not necessarily the names, but the stats. I don't know that they're obliged to make them public, but I can't see any reason why they wouldn't be. Why not? Yeah. yeah someone, needs to, someone needs to know. There needs to be a transparent yeah, process. Yeah, I can't see any reason why uh, a local authority, if they were asked that specific question, why they, why they wouldn't make it, uh, make it available, to be honest. Yeah. Um, just before we finish up, just one or two brief questions myself and maybe. Fiona, if you could take us through the establishment of the Commission, and you referred to establishing it initially on an administrative basis, which doesn't have any legislative powers. Maybe you could just bring us through your thought process and how that will actually work. And, and the second question I would have is in relation to, we'll have this commission set up, we have the referendum commission, and we have Zippo. So what's, you know, where's the difference or what, do you, do you know what I mean? If, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Chair. And I suppose, you know, um, uh, the key point uh, in this conversation is that we're talking about options here. So obviously policy decisions will be made. So a policy decision could be taken to establish a commission on a full legal basis right from the outset. So there will be different approaches then depending on which option is taken. So if, for example, it was decided that we would establish a commission on a non-legislative basis, first of all, and then move to, over time, to, uh, to I suppose, underpin that by legislation, there's certain functions that they would be able to carry out without having the legal basis to do so. Um, so I think, you know, for example, you'd be talking about research, as I say, awareness raising, uh, you know, voter engagement, possibly. Um, but then if, if they were to have um, functions that are already legally, legally assigned to another body, be that the local authorities or um, the referendum commission, uh, SIPO, then they would have to be given to them legally. So there would be a process then, obviously, the primary legislation, and it would take time then to to move to that place, I suppose. So it will really depend, I suppose, on the policy options that are taken around what the exact functions will be and then how it will be established. Um, from, uh, from our perspective, I suppose, you know, what we've set out in the consultation is that certainly ultimately, if there's an electoral commission established and if, you know, if it is decided to give them a certain set of functions, you would see them then taking over those roles, such as referendum commission, and um, the boundary commissions as well. So, you know, in terms of the constituencies and the local electoral areas. So, at the moment, they're serviced by the office of the ombudsman in terms of the secretariat. Um, so, I think that's, that's kind of the process. I'm not sure if you want any more detail, but that's it'll really depend. It's difficult to when 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 we're still in the options and option consideration phase. It's difficult to kind of set out a, a precise approach. But in general terms, that's how we would. Is there a happen. fear that? If you don't set it up on an administrative basis and then there's a change of government, all of a sudden it could not be of importance. And is, is there an element of that behind the thinking? Um, I, I mean, certainly from our perspective, um, you know, we are obviously here to implement uh, what, what, we're, what we are required to do, I suppose, in terms of prioritisation, in terms of government priorities. Um, I, the only thing I'd say is that the establishment of an electoral commission um, has been on quite a few programmes for government for, for a number of years. So um, um, that's, that's, I suppose, the, the history of it and, and how we've gotten to where we are today. So um, we can only proceed, I suppose, as, as, uh, 
as, as, we, can, as we can see fit, I suppose, depending on what, our, what we're instructed to do. Thank you. Any other follow-up questions? Okay, can I take this opportunity to thank the witnesses for attending today and engaging with the committee, and I'm sure we'll probably be seeing you again before this is sorted out, so thank you very much. I propose we go into private session to deal with some housekeeping matters. Is that agreed? Okay.